Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Adam Levy. He's going to share some stories about playing guitar with Nora Jones. I met Nora in a bar in New York. She had just arrived in New York. Uh, she was just this kid really from Dallas. She was still in music school. But we happened to be sitting next to each other at this bar, uh, waiting for our friend's band to play. And he walks in. He had met her somehow before. I, I don't know the whole story. And he said, oh, Adam, you have to meet Nora Jones. She's double kick, double ass. And <laughs> I, I asked him to explain. And what he meant was she, she's a kick-ass piano player and a kick-ass singer, singer-songwriter. So I was like, okay, double kick, double ass. This is somebody I should know. And we started talking about records that we liked. You know, she liked Roberta Flack. She liked Ray Charles. And I thought, well, well, maybe we should do something. So I did the thing that you would see in a movie. I wrote my number down on a cocktail napkin on a, with a borrowed pen. And not too long after that, she called me for just like a little nothing gig in New York. Not anything like what people think of when they think of Nora Jones. Maybe six months after that, had this uh, weekly gig at a place in New York called McCor. It's not there anymore, but it was like a Jewish community center. They had a performance space in there, and uh, Nora had a weekly gig there. And we played it to eight people. It was really like a very quiet gig. But eight people at that point who wanted to be there it was different from where we started, like with brunch gigs and stuff. So, you know, people who came there to hear the show, but they weren't. Uh, they weren't an army just yet. And then at the end of 2001, I think, before her record had come out, Rolling Stone magazine used to do these, maybe they still do, like Hot Issue. This is, the, this is who to look out for next year in music. And that is really where the tide started to change. Because the week after that hit the newsstands, the gig that had been eight people for weeks and months, suddenly they literally were turning people away. I had friends who, were, who tried to come to that show and couldn't get in. This free show that had been going on for months, same band, same tunes, nothing had changed except Rolling Stone uh, put, the, put her on the map and put um, that weekly gig on the map. So that was the first inkling. And then we kind of hung out at that uh, plateau for a little while, and we started to get these opening slots. We did a run opening for the Dave Matthews Band in huge, you know, they were playing like Hershey Park. These We had never done anything like that. Had no idea how to play to a, a sports arena. No idea. But we tried to figure it out. Um, we opened for the Indigo Girls. We opened for Taj Mahal. We opened some shows for John Mayer. When we thought we had arrived with Nora was when we had our own bus, because before that we were just in like a sprinter van and just going from gig to gig. And I remember we got our bus. It was still a small operation. It was just Nora and her boyfriend, Lee, who played upright bass and me on acoustic and electric guitar. And we had one tech who was traveling with us, this woman named Mary, who was really awesome. And I think that was it, you know, Maybe we had a front of, oh, we had a guy who was tour managing and doing front of house, but very small operation. And we thought, man, we've really arrived. We've got a bus. And then we did these shows opening for the Dave Matthews band and come to find out everyone in the band had their own bus. And we <laughs> just was just like, that's a thing. That's a thing. And they did. So six guys, six buses. I think they had 18 big rig trucks and uh, we got invited to do an opening a week with them opening. And uh, every night we left right after the show and Dave Matthews, after about three nights, uh, I remember him, him and his bass player came up and they're like, Hey, you know, it's kind of awkward to ask, but uh, we noticed you haven't been staying for the shows. Like, are, are you not into what we're doing? It's cool if you're not. We're just kind of, you know, we invited you to come be here and and it, we get to, to the end of our show and you're just gone. And they were very nice about it. It, it wasn't at all like a, hey, man, this isn't cool. It was just like, 
basically we'd love to hang more was like the vibe is like you know stick around but what had happened was dave matthews tour manager had told nora or or nora's tour manager like hey when you're done you have to get out of here because the parking lot choreography it, it doesn't like we you can't be here when these 18 trucks have to move and six buses so you got to go and that's what they had told Nora. And so that's what Nora told Dave Matthews. And he was like, what? Who, to who told you that? And he went, and I, I don't think that tour manager was around after that. <laughs> Which is a testament to Dave Matthews. It was like, hey, you know, you invite somebody to your, to your house, really. And then somebody that works for you says, oh, no, you, you, you got to go. He was like, no, we're not having that. If I mean, like, go if you want to. If you if you don't want to stick around, that's fine. But if you want to be here and you're you're getting out of here because somebody told you that that's not right. So that was I I always you know respected Dave Matthews for that. And we kind of were at that level for a while, and then suddenly we were starting to get headlining shows. And then so she did a four night run at the Fillmore as a headliner. No. I take that back. That particular run was we were opening for Willie Nelson four nights at the Fillmore. But that was just before. I mean, we had already started headlining. But still, when Willie says, do you want to open four nights at the Fillmore? You, you say yes. But yeah, that's a yeah, that's when things really started to happen. Was this a personal invitation from Willie? Was he hip to what was happening? That's a good question. I don't know. The, I always in my mind. Yes. In my mind, Willie reached out to Nora. But I don't know. I don't try to meet people backstage if it's if I'm, you know, I, I keep to myself. Of course, now looking and also I don't smoke and I couldn't imagine like going on his bus and not having a smoke. That just seems rude. So I I mean, I must have said hello or something like that. But I now I, I really wish I had tried to, to make a little more of a connection because I appreciate him so, so much. I mean, it, we were definitely more jammy on stage than what you would expect from the records, for sure. That was something that Nora um, made clear from from day one. It's like, okay, the, we're not here to play what's on the record. We're here to play music, and these songs should be alive. And anytime I would like fall back into just like, oh, I'll we'll play this, 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 she was just like, no, like pl like play, because she, she had. She used to come see me play in New York. There was a band that I was in called Killer Joey. It was like a jazz group that would just take it to the moon and back every night. And uh, she'd heard me play that way. And she's like, do, do, she's like, I know you can do that. So you don't have to be polite here. So there was more of a, of a jam element to our live show than people would expect from the records for sure. Imagine being like in your early 20s and you know just she didn't even get to finish school she had gone to north texas in denton to study jazz piano and thought that that's what she would do and you know within a couple of year, years you know in her early 20s she suddenly uh, a big marquee name you know playing we went from playing brunch gigs to playing sports arenas ourselves in a pretty short amount of time you know and also she's now got to be the boss of people and everyone in her band is, you know, at least 10 years older than her. So to have to like be the boss of grownups and make hard decisions and also like people are just clamoring for her time. When I started playing with her, the role of, you know, her agent and her management were like, let's try to make things happen. And pretty soon it was like, it was more about being gatekeepers. Like we have to say no to almost everything. And so that's stressful. I mean, I wouldn't know. That's not what my early 20s were like. But interestingly, you know, I, I played with Tracy Chapman for a little while in the mid 90s. And she had a similar thing, you know, she was just like busking in, in Harvard Square, she was a student at Tufts and got discovered and all of a sudden was like thrust into this completely different thing. And I think Nora in her way, like didn't see herself as wanting to be 
an entertainer and suddenly like that's who she had to be you know uh be on talk shows have stuff to say play to big crowds uh be not just a great songwriter and a musical artist but have to charm people from from the stage you know in larger and larger numbers so I thought she handled it all pretty gracefully and she was really generous to all of us. I remember uh, on the strength of the first record, we got hired to play a party for Amazon and I think it was their maybe 10th anniversary party, something like that. The headliner was Bob Dylan and uh, we were the support band and it was just for like a thousand Amazon employees and, you know, I don't know what she got paid for the gig, but she paid all of us more than we had ever been paid for any gig. So she was really happy to to share everything. And then when we made the second record, even though I wasn't really a songwriter, uh, she kind of uh, dared me to write a song and then recorded it on her second record. And on her second record, there's songs by every band member on the record. She did not have to do that. She could have written them all herself. She could have written with, you know, uh, track writers with a track record. So I really appreciated how generous she was and how much she wanted to keep it real. Yeah, there was a time, I can't remember where the gig was, but like Britney Spears came to the gig. I mean, we knew she was going to be there, but like she wanted to write a song with Nora. So her people talked with Nora's people and like, after our sound check, they went to this other room with a piano and were in there for a couple hours. Like that's to, to, from where we started, that seemed like a really weird thing to happen. But so much cool stuff happened. We got invited to do um, Prince had this thing called the New Power Generation, uh, which was a subscription thing. Very forward thinking. I mean, he was doing this before. A lot of people kind of figured out like, oh, yeah, you find your core crowd and you just that's your crowd. So he would do these shows at Paisley Park for just a thousand core fans. And like you couldn't buy a ticket otherwise. You had to be in his club, you know. So we got invited to Paisley Park. And um, at that point, Nora was still kind of an up and comer. He had he had also had Alicia Keys and. You know, he was kind of bringing in people who were on their way up. And we got to play a show opening for for Prince at Paisley Park. And it was just incredible. Were you around him at all that day? A little bit, a little bit. And he was, he made himself, at least to us, very easy to be around. He was super supportive of Nora. When we walked off stage and we walked back to our dressing room, he was waiting like at on the side, him and Larry Graham were just offside between us and the dressing room and just gave us a a huge, you know, well, I mean, I say standing ovation because they happened to be standing, but that was really genuine. Uh, But we were all still shy. Like six months later, we were on tour in London and he was also on tour in London and he sent a message to Nora like, hey, I'm having a party. Why don't you guys come over? And we, none of us did because we were just, we're like, we're not cool enough to, even though it was like a personal invitation, this wasn't like, you know, something orchestrated by management people. It's like Prince invited Nora and the band to come hang and party, and we were all just too, too shy. I wish I had, though. I wish I had. Well, a big one for me was uh, in 2004, we played at the Hollywood Bowl. And uh, I'm an L.A. kid. I grew up in Los Angeles. I remember in fifth grade, we took a field trip to the Hollywood Bowl. To me, it was like the Taj Mahal or something, you know, or or the Opry to, you know, to people who in, in Nashville. It was a real temple. Uh, so to get to play there, I couldn't quite believe that that's what we were doing. That's a personal one for me. And I guess that's always what this question is about because somebody else might be like oh yeah the Hollywood Bowl is whatever but it was a huge deal and it happened to also be on the uh, 20th anniversary of my high school reunion so uh, I invited my best friend Tom and he was like well I already was planning to go to the reunion I'm like dude I'm playing at the Hollywood Bowl 
I missed my 20th anniversary high school reunion to play at the Hollywood Bowl with you know Nora really at the peak of 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 things for her. So that felt like that was pretty satisfying. You know, we played at Red Rocks. That kind of blew my mind. We played at uh, we played on Saturday Night Live twice uh, on her first record and her second record. And on her first record, the guest was Robert De Niro, who I didn't have any interaction with backstage uh, at the, at the theater. But you know, like at the end of the show on Saturday Night Live, when the credits are rolling and everybody's out on stage, the band is out on stage, the the guest host is out, the, the cast is all out there. I was standing like arm's length from Robert De Niro and everybody's hugging and, you know, Lenny Pickett is playing saxophone and the band is just, you know, the the how the Saturday Night Live band, you know, it's an iconic thing. Yeah. Credits are rolling, the music is playing. And I still was like too shy. But then after there's an after party after you do Saturday Night Live, they rent out a whole restaurant and everybody goes. And I saw De Niro there and I I actually walked over to him at his table and I said, Mr. De Niro, I, I play with Nora and I really wanted to give you a hug on stage, but I was too shy. May I hug you now? And he looks at me, you know, he's at the dinner table with his friends and his kind of entourage. And he's like, yeah. And he stands up and we, we had a little hug. Oh yeah. <laughs> so that was definitely a, we're not in Kansas moment anymore. Uh, did you imagine him and Angel Hart eating the egg? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The first couple of years with Nora, one of the things that I liked the most about it, besides just that the music was great and the people in the band were great, is when we were playing kind of some more smaller shows, not not the Hollywood Bowls and the and the Red Rocks, but just a little more, you know, playing it like House of Blues or something like that. After the show, we'd hang, you know. It, we we weren't kind of spirited away to the bus or, you know, whatever. And it was cool because it it, ex, it extended the connection with the crowd. Like, you, you walk on stage, you play this music. And to then say, you know, thanks and good night. I mean, a lot of artists, that's what they want to do. I totally understand that. I'm pretty introverted. I don't always want to hang out after the show. But as a side guy and in a band that was really just kind of coming up, it was, I loved it. I loved it. You know, we'd play a show somewhere and then we'd sit at the bar and, and we talk to people or whatever. Like, I really liked that. It helped to me to ground the whole thing, you know, so that it, it felt complete, like, okay, we showed up, we sound checked, we played, we talked to people, met local folks who would say, oh, man, if you're hungry, you got to go over there. Or uh, if you're going to be in town a little bit longer, you, you got to check this thing out that maybe wouldn't be on your radar. You know, this was really before you could just Google, like, you know, 10 cool things to do in Toledo. Like, you know, you would need local people to, to, and so it felt great. Or somebody would tell you a story about the theater you were in, or, you know, just something about the town that you would never know. So I love that. But as things kind of got bigger and bigger, it wasn't like that anymore. I mean, Nora for sure didn't want to hang out in a bar and talk to strangers. And I would just kind of go with the flow. So it's like, okay, we're done. And now there's, you know, we go backstage and there's bright, pink or green gaff tape with arrows that are, you know, our tour manager or assistant has drawn like to the bus, like go to like all roads lead to the bus. You're backstage in, you know, a hockey arena or something. And you've spent the whole day there. You've taken a shower in the locker room of the, of the hockey arena. You want to go to the bus, you know, the bus is your cocoon. And, but it really, I didn't enjoy it as much. I really felt like we were in this kind of hermetic uh, bubble. So I, it wasn't as fun for me as as the early days, even though musically it was really you know satisfying. But um, the last tour that we did together as a band in 2007, which was still the same core band, the same bass player that had been there from the beginning, 
in the very beginning, we didn't even have a drummer. The first tour we did was just with no drums. But once she hired a drummer, a, a great player named Andrew Borger, uh, it was the same core band for three record cycles and three uh, tours and, and all that. But it was starting to a little bit feel just kind of like a a machine or something. And it, and at the same time, uh, I was married then, and my wife was uh, ill. She had a cancer called ocular melanoma, and uh, the doctors we saw said you have about five years. Like that's all anybody gets with ocular melanoma. And she was already a couple of years into that. And the way Nora was touring, she'd go out. We did on the, the last tour I did with her, we did 10 weeks in the U S we had one week off at home during which we had to do the today show. And I think something else. So it wasn't much of a week off and then get back on a plane and do 10 weeks in Europe with no breaks. And I was like, I, I can't do that. Uh, so at the end of that tour, I, I waited till the end of the tour to, to have the talk with Nora, but I knew in my heart that that's what was coming, that I needed to stay home. Um, and so, yeah, at the end of the, the last show I played with Nora was in Sopot, Poland, in, uh, I think, November of 2007. A neat side note was that uh, my wife, and actually she wasn't my wife at the, we hadn't, we hadn't officially gotten married, but I thought of her as my wife at the time. Even though she had this pathology, she was still basically, you know, healthy enough to do stuff, whatever she wanted to do. So she actually came out and visited. Uh, she came to Europe for a couple of days on that tour, and we had a neat holiday. But a really sweet thing happened. The whole tour, I'd been telling uh, our my guitar tech, this guy Trevor, you know, he saw me all, you know, every day. I'm like, I miss my wife. You know, I'd be on the phone with her. I'd be talking about her. And how I couldn't wait to get home. And I had, I had told him that she wasn't doing so well. And so he knew, you know, I was just thinking about her all the time. I didn't, I forgot to tell him that she was going to come out on the road for a couple of days and visit. So one night after a gig, we're in the hotel lobby bar. And uh, my wife is sitting on my lap and I'm having a drink and we're laughing and have, you know, being a little, maybe a little smoochy. And uh, my guitar tech, Trevor, is there. And after about five minutes, he kind of looks at me funny and he gets up and he just walks out. And I hadn't even had a chance to introduce him to my wife yet because we're just like having a, having fun. And the next day I saw him, I said, Trevor, I, what, what was that about? And he said, well, you know, you're out here on the road and every day all I hear about is my wife this, my wife that. And now here we are in Amsterdam and you just have this girl on your lap and like, what the hell, man? And I said, that's my wife. She's here visiting. That's my wife. So I then got a chance to introduce them. She came to the show. But I'm glad that she got to see what I was doing. You know, it's hard when you miss somebody uh, but I'm glad she got to see, you know, what the heck I was doing, you know, and, and, uh, we got to share that and she, she came on the bus. She had never been on a tour bus. She's not, she wasn't a musician or, you know, so all of that was real new to her. And she thought the whole thing was just a riot. She loved it. And Nora was completely understanding and cool about that. Oh yeah. I think she knew the writing was on the wall. You know, Nora knew that I was going to have to do that. And when I, it it took me 10 weeks on this European tour to finally work up to talking with her about it. I, and she she saw it coming. She, she knew. And it was actually good for her, for Nora, because I think after the third record, she was really wanting to do some different things. My dream in that band, I always wanted to be the Mike Campbell for Nora and just be there forever and even be part of side projects that she did or just, you know, that was, I really wanted to be that person. But at the same time, I think she felt a little bit trapped in the original band that she had. I appreciated that she was loyal to us, but I also knew that she was hearing other sounds and wanting to write different kinds of songs and she was getting interested in different producers. Like in the middle period when I was with her, uh, 
like in 2004 or something on the second tour. That's right around the time that uh, The Last Waltz was finally issued on DVD. Uh, it hadn't been available before that. And so if you're on a tour bus with a band and The Last Waltz comes out, you just watch it every day. That's what you're into. But by the third record, yeah, she was listening to more kind of, she was interested in today music and not necessarily interested in yesterday music. And I, I, I can't do that. You know, that's not, I'm not the guy to do that. None of us in the band really had the musical temperament to go and do the things that she wanted to do. So it was, I think, a good opportunity. It was a very natural break for her. Right around the time I left, um, the bass player in the band, they had been an item for all those years, and they were breaking up. So she was losing her bass player, I was leaving, and so she just did a complete refresh and put a whole new band together and, and kept that band for, for a while. And she's done that a couple of times. And I, I think that's a thing that artists do. 